Well, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for being here. Uh, this particular event has been a long time in coming, um, partly because of what happened in Christchurch, um, and we'll explain a little bit about that um, in a few slides' time. Um, today, one of the things I want to do is scare you and inspire you. So hopefully, if you're frightened, you're inspired into action. So I, I want to take a moment at the beginning of this to kind of reflect on life events and how they impact us at a digital level and at a societal level and, and how what we're experiencing in the real world is starting to change what happens in the digital world or is reflected in the digital world.
So it's interesting to kind of reflect on our experience of going to the beach. A little bit different to what you see in the top left hand corner there. It's a little bit interesting to reflect on our experience of marriage and what it means. Um, possibly the more relatable for the sports fans in the audience is the experience of going to a large stadium. And what probably seems quite distant in New Zealand is the idea of military might and muscle and force and a display of force like that. So these are all excerpts from a movie called uh, Human. It was uh, commissioned by the United Nations and it's actually about how humans are impacting uh, the landscape. And it's a beautiful, beautiful film, but is actually um, about four hours long. You have to watch it in two parts. It's, it's on YouTube and it's the, the, the photography is sumptuous. It's a really interesting insight into our changing world and actually the things that we have in common across borders. One of the issues that we're dealing with is pollution. This is going to have a very big impact on our lives going forward. We're aware of it, global warming. Um, you know, uh, there was a story in the news just the other day about reaching the bottom of the Marinaris Trench and finding plastic waste. I think it was about 13 kilometers down in the ocean depths. You know, population and migration are causing tensions across the world. I don't want to mention walls, but they're not necessarily the answer to overpopulation and migration issues. You're seeing the rise of tribalism in terms of um, how people are forming tribes like Remainers or Ramonas and uh, those that want to leave or leavers in the context of Brexit. Brexit sorry. And then we've seen the rise of nationalism. You know, just yesterday, uh, President Trump was talking about the uh, Prime Minister of Hungary and what a great guy he is because of his nationalist policies. So these are all tensions that are affecting us on a daily basis. And we don't necessarily think about their impact in a place like New Zealand or Australia, um, but information operations are part of what is occurring in this milieu of change that we're experiencing. So one of those examples in terms of where information operations had a place, and information operations, by the way, is using disinformation to see discord amongst a group of people. Uh, and so this had a role to play in the Brexit referendum. Clearly, if you've tuned into the news over the last two or more years, you'd be familiar with how uh, information operations are being investigated in the States. And it's not just isolated to Brexit or the US. You know, Putin and, and Russia um, were actively involved in sowing discord in the French presidential uh, election. So this is a picture of Putin with Marie Le Pen, far-right candidate. We're also dealing with things like information hacking. So uh, one of the, the first examples of that is Facebook being hacked as part of uh, or their information being used in a way that uh, it did not realise as part of the 2016 uh, presidential election. What we don't realise is how much of our information we're giving to Google, for instance, and how exposed we are in terms of not only what we're searching on, but how influenced we are by uh, just the autocomplete in a Google search. That can make a big difference in terms of your decision making on what to search for. Um, Uber was fined 178 million US dollars last year for being, uh, their drivers were hacked. So basically money was skimmed from Uber drivers. So information hacking is a very real thing. It's happening to us every day. And Peter's going to be talking a little bit more about that. But the other side of things is, you know, there are 
leaders amongst us who are sowing discord. And disinformation in this context is about things like conspiracy theories. And, you know, birtherism is something that actually brought Trump to the fore in US pol politics. And it might be surprising to learn that the belief in conspiracies is a lot greater than you necessarily think. So 54% of um, people in the States believe that the 9-11 attacks weren't necessarily, what we were told was not necessarily true. Staggeringly on here, the moon landing, um, there's 24% of people that don't think that the moon landing was told accurately. Um, and there's still a full 30%, oops, full 30%, go back, sorry, full 30% still believe that Obama didn't necessarily reveal his true birth certificate. He's still born overseas and made him ineligible to be president. I want to put that in a New Zealand context for just a moment. So uh, there's a lecturer from Victoria University here that has identified that there are thousands of New Zealanders that believe what happened on the 15th of March in Christchurch was some sort of information operation or conspiracy. There are those amongst us who believe that what happened there was all part of a staged attack of some sort. Thousands. Something like 5% of the population. That's quite scary to contemplate. So with that in mind, I thought I'd uh, bring up what happened on the um, 15th of March. Um, the primary reason why we actually put off the event is because we were going to be streaming live, which is something that happened on the 15th of March. But also we were going to be talking about disinformation and misinformation warfare. And that's something that happened in terms of the stream that there was on the 15th of March. Um, so, you know, this is an excerpt from Tuesday the 19th, so about four days later of the New York Times page. So this made global news. You know, the, the activity that occurred on the 15th of March was something that the perpetrator wanted to get global attention for, and they succeeded. And I suppose it's heartening at one level that the response that there's been to this, you know, just this morning, breaking news from Jacinda Ardern um, uh, in Paris, I think it is, um, you know, that there is an accord that has now been um, signed by 17 countries to try and deal with some of the issues around live streaming. Um, I want to share a couple of statistics, though, from the, the 15th of, of March. Because I think for us as New Zealanders, we think we're far removed from disinformation and misinformation warfare. But Christchurch kind of brought this home that we're part of a global community, part of the, the disinformation, misinformation world. So there were 4,000 views of the live stream before anyone reported it and it took a full 30 minutes for it to be reported. So that's just in the 30 minutes around the attack. Within 24 hours, 1.5 million uploads were made, or copies were uploaded to social channels. Now, face, uh, actually it was Facebook in particular. Um, Facebook caught 1.3 2 million of those, there were a full 300,000 that got through the filters. So there were 300,000 copies of that video that got uploaded and could potentially be viewed. What's a little bit more scary is that some seven weeks later, there were still nine copies floating around out there. That it's still possible, if you dig hard enough, to find copies of that, that video. So the problem that we're dealing with here in terms of information warfare, disinformation, misinformation and agendas around propaganda and conspiracies is a very difficult nut to crack is really the, the essential point I wanted to talk about there. 
So let's not talk about scary things. Let's talk about where we're at in terms of the fourth industrial revolution or um, industry 4.0. Those of you who would be familiar with this know that we're in the midst of the fourth industrial revolution. And the first industrial revolution was about uh, the introduction of mechanization. So most of, most of, many of us studied um, the industrial revolution when we were at school. But the thing to note here in terms of the 1800s and the relative degree of complexity that there was in terms of that first industrial revolution is that it was comparatively low. So the second industrial revolution was about the manufacturing line, division of labor, mass production, and the use of electricity. Third industrial revolution was about the introduction of electronic systems to automate production. And you notice that the degree of complexity is going up with each period, but also the time period in which these things are occurring is exponential. So now that we're in the midst of the cyber physical um, revolution, the degree of complexity of what we're dealing with is much greater. And it's having a significant impact on our behaviours, on how we interact. And I want to take you on a little journey around how that's occurred and unfolded over the last uh, 30 odd years. So Internet 1.0, which was around 1990, and I can remember this, um, sadly, was about the digitization of information. It used to be that if you needed to find out something, you had to go to the library and look it up. Or if, you, if you've been sold Encyclopedia Britannica, you could go and look it up there. What do we do now when we want to find out something? We pull out our phones. So much has changed in just 30 years that Today alone, every second, there are 75,000 Google searches. That's about 7 trillion searches a year. And on average, each one of you in this room is Googling between three and four times a day. If you think about how often you Google, it's, many of us here would be doing more than that. Um, YouTube has been a phenomenon that has not necessarily been recognised in terms of just how much information is now being digitised in that process. Because 60 seconds of video is worth 1.8 million words or 3,600 3, uh, web pages. So in 60 seconds, the human mind can absorb 1.8 million words rather than reading them on pages. And today alone, uh, so there are 78,000 um, uh, YouTube videos viewed every second. That is about uh, 1 billion hours viewed per day. That's quite a significant quantity. Now, email, the thing that first came out in, in 1990. So there's 2.7 million or 7 trillion emails sent every year. Now, the kind of ridiculous thing about that is that 45% of those emails sent are spam. So nearly half of all email is just waste. So Internet 2.0 came along where we decided to actually start to transact online. So the rise of shops and stores online to the extent that Amazon now processes 600 transactions per second on the Amazon platform. Um, one that's often overlooked is the size of the Apple store. It's now an $11 billion a year store. Uh, eBay is a $10 billion a year store online. And PayPal accounts for a further 10 billion in transactions per year. So this is around 2000. We started to move into the Internet 2.0. Internet 3.0 is the rise of social interaction uh, on the web. Today alone, there'll be 3.2 billion likes on Facebook alone. 3.2 billion likes today 
expressing social preference. It's an insight into our minds that we've never had access to before. There'll be 95 million Instagram pictures uploaded today. There'll be 16 million searches on LinkedIn for people. And there are now 500 million professionals on LinkedIn, 40% of whom are actually checking that on a regular basis. Those in the room that use Tinder, hands down. <laughs> There'll be 1.6 billion swipes today alone. Again, another interesting insight into human behavior. And then there will also be 500 million tweets today, and not all of them from Donald Trump. Internet 4.0 is this interesting time that we now live in where we're starting to connect sensors and devices to the network so that we're starting to gain information about physical objects uh, from anything to the temperature that there is of a fabric through to inbuilt heart rate monitors and devices that are all feeding up into the cloud and they're generating 2.5 quintillion pieces of data every day. So we're in the midst of what you could describe as being a data tsunami in terms of the amount of information that is now being generated and it is only set to go up exponentially. So um, this is a prediction from Cisco and I realize that 2020 is just around the corner, but by 2020 Cisco think that there'll be 50 billion uh, things connected to the network. And I mean, already we're seeing electric skateboards, for instance, you know, with sensors, electric engines, you know, connected to remote controls with Bluetooth, which are also connected to apps that connect into the cloud. So being able to pull even more uh, intricate tricks on a skateboard is going to be able to be recorded digitally and you're going to be able to enhance what you're doing in terms of performance via that feedback mechanism that you're getting from a digital device. So um, many of you here would be aware of uh, an interesting little statistic, but um, uh, about 2015, the workforce changed demographically so that the majority of the workforce are now millennials, so they're in their 20s. Those of us from my generation and above, we're actually in decline now in terms of the number of people that make up the workforce. But an interesting thing about Internet 4.0 is can anyone guess what this list is? Be bold. Google searches. Google searches. So Google has now turned into, or the internet has now turned into, a parenting mechanism. Like, I didn't learn to tie a tie from the internet in my childhood. Um, I'm not sure where I learned to kiss, but that's another story. <laughs> but um, the interesting thing here is the types of questions that are now actually being asked um, and the types of insights that are available instantly for five-year-olds, 12-year-olds, and 90-year-olds in terms of the ability to learn and solve problems at a pace and in a manner um, that's not been possible before. And it's changing how we are absorbing information, figuring things out. It's kind of interesting that, uh, you know, pancakes, French toast, and belly fat are all in the, in the top 10. You know, it's probably pointing to a, an obesity epid epidemic, epidemic. The interesting thing about Internet 4.0, when you think about social media being uh, connected to this, thinking about how e-commerce is connected to it, how our search history and viewing history is all connected to it, along with these different sensors and devices that we might have, it's possible for these platforms to know more about ourselves than we know about ourselves. So the insights that are coming from this are enabling us to better understand ourselves in quite surprising ways. One of the challenges around 
um, the digitization of things uh, in the fourth industrial revolution is that as we augment our minds and bodies, the definition of what is a natural system is shifting. And that's a necessary part of the digitization of things. Anyone here guess what that is? It's actually a prosthetic limb. That is a modern day prosthetic that I want to share with you now. So feel through a robotic prosthetic. And the interesting thing about this is that these limbs have come from a research program from DARPA, which is the defense um, uh, research facility in the States. So, it, and it really does raise serious ethical questions. You know, what it is to be human is altering. You know, there is Darth Vader, Luke Skywalker. You know, this science fiction character is now actually coming alive. When I was looking at this, I was thinking about Bionic Woman um, or Bionic Man, the $6 million man from the 1970s. You know, this is not that far away in terms of what we're going to be able to do, not only to improve people's lives, but there will undoubtedly be unintended consequences of these technologies. And that's one of the things that we've experienced with social media and Facebook, for instance, in terms of what happened in Christchurch. Um, <clears throat> so let's take a moment to think about your future at work. Let's bring it back to ourselves. Um, the, the ways in which we're going to be gathering information, interfacing with information, are shifting you know, from devices like the one on my wrist to um, being able to actually potentially use devices like this to be able to see inside of ourselves. So uh, thermal imaging, different types of techniques for seeing uh, different things are all going to become possible. You think about how much has just changed from the time that you got your first smartphone. So it was 2009 that the iPhone came out. 10 years later, how have they changed our lives? Just in terms of entertaining the kids, for instance. We just use that as an example. But in our workplace, um, the types of things that we will be able to do are quite different to the types of things that we're doing today. Those of you that have had a reasonably long career can remember what it was like before the computer. You know, now we're uh, starting to interface with technology in quite a different way, and it's going to open up enormous possibilities in terms of what's possible for you in what you do. So it actually has the potential to unleash a much greater level of creativity. So, one of the things I wanted to do is just share some insights with you around um, this, which is that this will be incremental. It's not going to happen overnight. There isn't going to be suddenly one morning you're going to wake up and suddenly typing pools disappeared or the job of a typist disappeared. It will be gradual. That's one of the, the first things. The second thing is what we've experienced and this is kind of a, an example of it in terms of a shared workspace, is we're disaggregating uh, the norms that we've had previously, where a workplace was fixed that you um, went to, you sat at your desk, your cubicle, etc. Now they are social spaces, they are freelance contractor spaces, there's a whole range of different things there. Lastly, um, we have to expect the unexpected. Now that's challenging, but our need to evolve as a species is actually creating unexpected consequences and we need to work on ourselves to be prepared to adapt to those things. So just to sum up, sum up we live in a world of uncertainty, volatility and increased complexity. What does that mean for us? is that the new imperative is for us to embrace the talents that you don't necessarily know that you have. That's the opportunity that lies in this big shift, which is the fourth industrial revolution. How do you go about that? One of the key things is to be able to discern fact from fiction. And that's part of what Peter's going to be talking about now. Um, 
you know, fake news is a very real thing. Disinformation warfare is a very real thing. Conspiracy theories are a very real thing. It's important that we equip ourselves to be able to discern fact from fiction. At a personal level, I would recommend that you work on your purpose, your promise, and what story you want to tell in your career, which will span many companies in this day and age. And lastly, focus on unlocking your creativity. Because if you focus on your creativity, all sorts of possibilities will flow from that in terms of the technologies that are available today. So thank you very much. That's my presentation.